Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in just one moment. So get settled, get a nice beverage, snack, comfort stuffed animal, <laughs> perhaps a notebook. I don't have any of those things. I probably should have one of those things. Um, and we'll get started in just a moment. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I think I know most of the people in the room. I'm not a lot of the people in the room. Um, my name is Kyle Livy. Um, I'm a faculty member here in history um, and co-director of the Lytton Center for History and the Public Good. And I am really excited to welcome you to um, this workshop featuring um, Dr. Alberto Ledesma, um, sponsored by the Lytton Center. Um, we're really, really honored to have him here and to have him as our mentor in residence this fall. Um, so I'm going to let our fellow co-director, um, Catherine Michael in political science, introduce him in just a moment. Um, we want to make sure that you sign in and get credit um, for this exceptional professional development opportunity. Um, so we're going to put a link in the chat in just a moment <clears throat> um, for you to do that. Um, this is a really, really great workshop and we're really excited to have um, uh, Alberto here with us. Um, and so um, we're gonna, I'm going to hand things over to Catherine and then I'm going to put that link in the chat in just a second. So Catherine, are you ready to go ahead and introduce Alberto? I am. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, so I'm going to introduce our, our uh, fantastic speaker today. Dr. Alberto Ledesma is Assistant Dean for Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity in the Division of Arts and Humanities at UC Berkeley. Dr. Ledesma grew up in East Oakland and received his undergraduate and graduate degrees from UC Berkeley. He earned a PhD in Ethnic Studies in 1996 and is a former faculty member at California State University Monterey Bay and a lecturer in Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. He has held several staff positions at UC Berkeley, including Director of Admissions at the School of Optometry and Writing Program Coordinator at the Student Learning Center. He is the author of the award-winning illustrated autobiography, Diary of a Reluctant Dreamer, Undocumented Vignettes from a Pre-American Life. We are so lucky to have him here with us today. So Alberto, I will hand it over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do a presentation. I'm doing a PowerPoint, so I'm going to share my screen. I hope that the technology works. Uh, we tried this out. Um, and so here is, uh, give me a thumbs up if, if it works. Uh, great. And so um, again, uh, my name is Alberto. Um, I am the assistant dean, as, you, uh, as I was mentioned, at, at UC Berkeley in the Arts and Humanities. I want to thank Kyle um, for in the Lytton Center um, for inviting me to have this conversation with you about the ways that we can help create a pipeline for success for disproportionately impacted community college students um, who are aspiring to get into graduate school at places like Berkeley and beyond. I am thrilled to be here among all of you, knowing that you are committed to supporting these incredible students. Um, in your classroom, in your offices, um, and that you know how hard they work to prepare themselves for the transfer process. Before I begin, I want to start uh, with a land acknowledgement. Um, oops, sorry about that. Um, I, um, I can't see the whole land acknowledgement, so I'm going to move um, here. We recognize, and, and here I am, I'm coming to you from UC Berkeley, so um, I'm going to read it from that perspective. Uh, we recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo-speaking Ohlone people, 
the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekwa Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold the University of California, Berkeley, more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous people. This acknowledgement um, was um, created by the Muwekma Ohlone tribe in our own Native American Student Development Office, and it's a living document. So today, I am happy to be here to discuss the following with you. What are the challenges and opportunities faced by disproportionately impacted, and by this I mean underrepresented racial minority students, LGBTQ plus students, first generation transfer students, when they enter schools like Berkeley and other UCs, uh, when they enter four year institutions on their way to graduate programs? What are the inclusive and affirming spaces that typically respond to these challenges and opportunities? What are some key programs that they should know as they prepare themselves for graduate study? What does the graduate admissions process entail from a transfer student perspective? And why is it that the statement of purpose is of such particular importance as they are applying to graduate school? I also want to offer a note on the effective experience as transfer students arrive on campus. And lastly, I want to answer your questions with the time that we have left. I have seen so many of these amazing transfer students at Berkeley over the years, and they have always impressed me and inspired me. But they have also always struck me because of the frequent shock that they have experienced as soon as they have arrived on campus. These students are smart and resourceful on their own, but when they know how to navigate the resources available to them, I have always seen them thrive. My hope is that this information exchange that we have today will help create a more supportive process that can benefit you as you counsel them and me and others like me as we welcome them to our campuses. But before I start, um, I wanted to share a little bit more about me. Like uh, many of the students that we will be discussing today, I was also a first generation uh, in disproportionately impacted student, except that I did not go to community college. I come from a Mexican immigrant family and grew up in East Oakland. I attended UC Berkeley again for my uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD and, and got my degree in 1996. My research was on, undocument, on the undocumented immigrant experience in literature. And as was mentioned, I was also, I'm also an illustrator and a creative writer. I have been an admissions director and have run a writing tutoring program. And over the last eight years, my job has been to get disproportionately impacted um, students to graduate school. This is something that I'm passionate about. Now, what I would like to know is um, who you are. So, um, so that I can know who's in the room, if you can please use the chat and introduce yourselves to me and let me know your names and what departments uh, you're coming from. Uh, please use the chat to do that. Hello, Eli. Great to see you here. Fantastic. Great. I, I'm happy to see so many departments being present, uh, represented here. So we seem to have pretty wide representation here. Thank you so much. 
as you probably know, um, um, or, or excuse me, what I wanted to do here is begin with a little bit of context. Um, and I wanted to share some data that I gathered um, from uh, the UC Office of the President. Um, many of you have probably seen this data uh, before, um, given that these uh, come from 2015. I, and yet they're still uh, relevant uh, to the transfer student experience. That's why I wanted to share it again, um, given that, that I think that they're still important. Um, so compared to most American universities, UC enrolls a higher percentage of transfer students, typically as the Association of American Universities reports, 30% of UC's incoming classes were transfer students compared to 24% at other AAU public institutions and 11% at private. So our universities at the UC system, you know, we do a pretty good job of enrolling uh, transfer students. About half of UC transfer students receive Pell grants and about two thirds of transfers have their tuition fully covered. And so that means that in terms of their uh, financial um, ability to cover their expenses, you know, they, they do have need. Half of UC transfer students are first generation and over one third come from homes where English is a second language. Over half of transfer students graduate in two years and 85% or more in four years above the national average. And UC transfer students graduate at a higher rate, 87%. With four years, within four years, than those who entered as freshmen, uh, which is 84%. Again, these are pretty dramatic uh, um, data points. Now, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about where your students are going, and, and you probably know or have a pretty good sense of this. Uh, in the last cycle, you had 271 students who went to UC campuses, um, um, who transferred over to UC campuses. And, and the map looked like this. Um, and it was really interesting. Um, to me, uh, these numbers in and of themselves are very interesting in that they suggest each campus's recruitment efforts, relative competitiveness, and what program students who were applying felt were being receptive to their interests. Still, it's fascinating that UC Davis has much larger numbers than Berkeley or UCLA. Then again, UC Davis is already designated as an HSI campus, while Berkeley is not. And that might have been a significant factor in the decision-making of the students. When getting into graduate school, the selectivity of the undergraduate school students are attending does matter in affecting what graduate programs they eventually get into. This, this selectivity, however, is already being influenced while the students are in community college and it's a two-way street. While many students may want to attend um, the most academically competitive school that they can, campus climate and a sense of belongingness does matter to them when they are making choices about where to go. UC Davis is already Hispanic serving institution on this map. Um, UC Berkeley is not. And to what degree did that matter to the students when they were applying? To what matter does a sense of belongingness affect their achievement? How might that balance out uh, relative to their opportunities for graduate school? This map, uh, in my opinion, is a, is a lot more complex than it might first appear. Um, when my older sister, Sylvia, um, um, attended Chebo College, um, uh, in my family, the only person who attended community college was my older sister, Sil uh, Sylvia. Um, I had already graduated uh, from ethnic studies um, in the doctoral program, and I thought that she was going to, you know, be um, talking to me, and, you know, and that she was going to be relying on me to, to, to tell her no, like all I knew, so that, that that she would do well. And as she was preparing to transfer, we did have a few conversations and chats about the process and what she could look forward to. But in many ways, you know, given that she was the eldest. You know, she actually wanted to do it on her own. And, you know, she's like very stubborn and persistent. And she's very bright and hardworking. And, and she's, you know, this very independent person and, and, and wanted to do it on herself, uh, by herself. Uh, sometimes, however, um, while you might have a lot of grit, what you need is information. 
even with two PhDs in the family, because by that time, my other sister, Maria, was actually already in a PhD program herself also. Um, my sister, Sylvia, did struggle a little bit. And here's why. Because there are structural challenges when you get to, um, to the campus. Um, there, with the academic transition, transferring to a highly competitive institution like Berkeley and other UCs can present academic challenges due to the differences in academic culture, coursework and expectations. It may require adjusting to a new kind of academic discourse, managing heavier workloads, and interact, interacting with a heavier, um, high, with a hierarchy, excuse me, of academics who have a series of intimidating titles next to their names. What does it mean, for example, that you're working with a professor that is supposed to be advising you um, on your research project, and, and the title, and his, his title is that he's the 20th century endowed cha chair of Francophone literature and culture in Caribbean studies. What does that mean? Sense, uh, excuse me, financial pressures. The, um, this is another challenge. The cost of attending UCs can be, say, a significant burden for transfer students, especially for students who are have been used to attending schools to cost so much less. Navigating financial aid options and managing um, expenses can be stressful in a large bureaucracy. If you have questions, how do you resolve them quickly? Sense of belonging. UCs are large, highly siloed institutions and disproportionately impacted transfer students may experience feelings of isolation or a lack of belonging. Building a social support network, especially when they are being pressured to finish their programs faster than other students and finding a sense of community can be challenging. When you get on campus, where do you go first? The department where you are doing your major, the cultural center, if there is one, the advising office, who is your advocate? And then there's cultural adjustment. Disproportionately impacted transfer students may face challenges related to cultural adjustment such as adapting to a new campus climate, social norms, or different engagement expectations within the classroom compared to their previous institutions. The academic discourse may feel like a different language than they need to master, and it may take them time to do it. Who are the cultural ambassadors that they can trust most? And then there's intersectionality. Disproportionately impact the students who identify with multiple underrepresented groups may face unique challenges resulting from the intersection of their identities. These challenges can include stereotypes, discriminations, and finding spaces that cater to their specific needs. And it may take them time to find affinity spaces that resonate uh, with their individual identities. So how is it that you help them with these challenges? So let me open up the room and, and, and let's talk just for a little bit about, about this. And maybe we, I can take maybe a couple of, um, of folks, you know, just in terms of the conversations that you have and the way that you discuss these challenges, how is it that we help them with these challenges? Yes, uh, August. Oh, thanks. So um, I'm a recent hire at Alerni and uh, I, pretty much fall within the framework that you're describing because I started off at a community college. Uh, I'm the first one who went to college. I'm the only one who graduated. And so uh, whenever I'm in a classroom with my students who seem to have an affinity for academics or wanting to go to Berkeley or Davis or UCLA, um, I always start off with just telling them my story so that they know that you know, it may seem like they're the only one, but they are actually part of the majority of students, especially in a community college where um, they might come from uh, ethnic backgrounds that aren't uh, represented in schools, or they might come from economic backgrounds that may make it seem like they can't go to R1 institutions like I did. But a lot of it has to do with the lack of information. So it's actually cheaper for them to go to you know, Princeton or University of Chicago compared to UCLA because there are grants available 
uh, but it's just information that isn't available to them. And it wasn't to me either. Um, and it was only faculty members who relayed their stories and made it clear that um, I could have a future if that's the path that I want to take. So I, I usually always start with myself. Uh, that is that is great. That is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, maybe let's take one or two more. Yes, uh, Jennifer. Hi. First, I want to say thank you so much for this workshop. I was uh, beyond excited when I saw it listed because I felt like it was a, a, such an important conversation that has been missing. Um, and for me, this has always been something that I keep in mind. I was a student at Ohlone College, and I know similar to um, how Augie shared, you know, what made a difference for me was hearing those stories from faculty members, that that was the first thing that made me really think that maybe college was a possibility for me and even opened the doors to understanding that there was more beyond Ohlone and a bachelor's that I was just kind of learning the pi what the pipeline even looked like. Um, and so it was like really starting from point one, like what even exists and then having to imagine myself going through that. And um, it was really faculty who shared their experiences that opened all of the opened all of that up for me. And so um, now having the opportunity to be back, um, that's something that I always keep in mind too. And I I found that a lot of it has been just a lot of like one on one work, like really getting to know students, um, and that it doesn't happen, you know, typically it doesn't happen in one or two meetings. That it's really developing like long lasting relationships um, and communicating with students inside the classroom and then getting them comfortable to start interacting outside of the classroom. Um, but one of the difficult things has been that it's very intensive work, you know, yes. it, it, it takes a lot. Um, it's, you know, making yourself accessible through phone and text and meeting up with students at night and on the weekends and during summer and all the breaks. And so we know one of the things that we've worked on, which Eli has been really great about too, um, was, was like, well, how do we, um, how do we incorporate this into the structure of what we do? And, and it's kind of hard to do that without having real support from the college to do that. Um, and so, it's like, you know, we're working with students individually. Um, and they're just individual, like us individually, one-on-one -on -one with students. And so we started to create workshops just to demystify the process of graduate school. Um, Cause I felt like as a transfer student myself, that was a big hurdle um, that I faced was that, you know, in community college, nobody was really talking about graduate school. And so I didn't know what came after transfer. And then I got to Berkeley and then everybody's talking about graduate school and I was just trying to survive and didn't have time to really do the research or you know, figure out what all the different paths look like. And so at least starting to get students um, introduced to the, to the idea of what is graduate school? What are the different paths you can take? Um, but looking at ways of getting support from the college so that we can do this, um, so that there's different avenues and it's not just falling on individual people and. Um, just to get the resources and support that we need to be able to do that. Thank you so much, Jennifer. You're, you did amazing in kind of uh, predicting where it is that we're going to go. And so I'm going to go ahead and move um, in that direction. That, that's exactly, um, while there are these structural challenges, I think, you know, what, what we just heard is that, you know, faculty at uh, community college subsidize so much, you know, of, you know, preparing our students you know, um, and, and with that information. And and, um, and and yet, you know, there are, um, you know, when um, we uh, talk about um, challenges, um, you know, uh, I also want to mention, um, you know, one of the challenges that we didn't discuss is intersectionality. And that is when our students get into um, to, um, the four-year university, uh, the it's disproportionately impacted students, um, they identify with different uh, underrepresented groups and face unique challenges resulting from the intersection of their identities. And these challenges can include stereotypes, discrimination, and finding spaces that cater to their specific needs. And, and it often takes some time to find those, those spaces 
that are their proper homes. And, and I think, you know, the places that will champion their experiences and the, the, the best people that they know that are championing them already as they're transitioning are their faculty from their community college. But they can bring their faculty to the to the university. And so that's why that, you know, how it is that they learn that information um, at the at the four-year institution becomes so important. So, you know, when they get um, to the four-year institution, immediately they're they're confronted with these opportunities. You know, um, when students get there, especially in the places like Berkeley, there's all these opportunities that, you know, all of a sudden uh, they're faced with. There's access to resources. UCs um, like Berkeley offer this, you know, wide array of support services and resources, um, including academic advising, mentorship programs, counseling, and affinity groups. These resources can provide a valuable support to transfer students as soon as they arrive. But there, there is a huge menu. It's a huge, huge menu, and it's a job on on it onto itself, you know, just to be able to to know what to choose. You know, I'm sure that if, when you've gone to a restaurant and it has like, you know, a 20 page menu, it takes you a long time to choose what it is that you're gonna eat, right? Because it's just so much. And so students experience that also when they get to the campus and then they have a need and they're trying to decide, well, where do I go for help? And there's so many places to go. There's a lag in terms of knowing exactly where, where do I go? There's also a um, diverse um, community. UC campuses have diverse students, staff, and faculty populations, providing opportunities um, uh, for, for them to connect with peers, staff, and faculty who might share similar experiences uh, and backgrounds as them. These connections can certainly foster a sense of belonging, but again, where do you start? You know, what's the best, you know, uh, place, you know, where's the best place to begin? Um, how do you connect with the staff? How do you connect with the students? Do you go to, um, let's say, an affinity student group meeting first? Do you go to an office hour? Um, do you go to, let's say, um, if you have, um, if there's a staff member who's known to meet with um, uh, particular kinds of students, do you go and talk to them first? Um, the campus might be known for their academic excellence. You see certainly across the system uh, have this uh, reputation. Um, and that could be certainly an opportunity there's research opportunities, faculty expertise. Um, students can benefit from these resources to excel academically right away, but there are ways that you start uh, around this, you know, and there's usually procedures around this. There's also advocacy and activism. UCs are known for their commitment to social justice and activism. And I know a lot of students that I work with, that's one of the things that attracts them certainly to Berkeley disproportionately impacted transfer students can engage in this activism. And that's, that, that's something that matters to them. They can join student organizations, participate in initiatives that promote equity, inclusion, and social change. And, and that's often a good place you know, for them to find a sense of connection. Transferring um, to uh, the university also can lead um, to personal growth. It can lead uh, to opportunities to have a transformative experience. Um, students may have a chance to develop resilience, leadership skills, and a strong sense of self-identity while navigating the challenges and opportunities presented at the institution. One thing to note is that these students, um, try, um, their experiences can vary widely. Um, we know that every student's experience is unique and so, they all can start in, 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 in various places. And while opportunities are plentiful, they can also be overwhelming, um, especially when students are already experiencing sensory overload at uh, these large institutions. That's why it's so important to learn about the layout of the university and to um, get information and make connections as soon as possible. That's why your role, and, and when you're talking about you know, having those you know those those community college teachers and advisors that become champions that's why they they're so so important my sister ended up majoring in something totally different than what i knew uh, she ended up majoring in french uh, while she did experience a bit of culture shock when she got to berkeley especially with berkeley's writing requirements she eventually had an amazing learning uh, uh, experience 
and it was because of her community college teacher. Uh, her community college teacher got her connected to faculty that she knew in the department and, and, um, and ended up you know, being a fantastic bridge from Chabot to Berkeley. And, and that, was, that, 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 was, that was it. When we're talking about students that are trying to get to graduate school, um, I mean, we're talking about, I mean, these are challenges and opportunities that face every student. But when we're talking about graduate school, we're talking about these challenges and opportunities that now are, are we're putting them in the context of time pressure where quick decisions become even quicker because of needing to get to graduate school and then needing to get to graduate school with, with specific kinds of learning plans. And so um, there are these uh, uh, um, inclusive and affirming spaces that help students get to graduate school. But when you come in and you're already on the clock, these spaces, their significance becomes even more, more important. And so I wanted to show you what some of these spaces and you know to, to name and some of you who have been to Berkeley probably know them really well. Uh, but I just want to begin to list them. That way you can see just how many there are. And this is just a partial selection of these spaces. That way you can get a sense of just what the menu looks like. And then we can get a sense and, and, and talk a little bit about you know, um, you know, when we talk, when we, when we're thinking about helping our students get into graduate school, how important planning becomes. And so, inclusive and affirming spaces. These are places that are designed to help students generally, but also to help them get to graduate school. There's of course the Transfer Student Center. It's an amazing resource for all students. Uh, it's set up, you know, to help them in the transition, but it's set up also to help them make effective choices in their curriculum as they're trying to get you know, to the next stage. Um, there's the educational opportunity program in terms of making effective decisions. One thing again um, that I want to um, um, note is please don't um, worry about taking notes because I will make a copy available of this um, presentation so that everyone has it. Um, and, and so, um, you know, you don't have to worry about you know needing to know all these resources. There's the Student Parent Center. Um, one of the things that I um, have met is quite a number of transfer students who are parents and who want to go to graduate school. And um, it's amazing um, when I I work with a lot of departments in the arts and humanities. That's where my position is located. To me, what I find amazing is how many graduate programs assume. Um, not not explicitly, but they sometimes assume that that you know uh, in in the way that they prepare their um, their process for you know uh, when students apply, uh, their their idea of a student is not is not you know non traditional students are student, are student parents you know and, and, and they have they have uh, they have other obligations, and the assumption of what a student is often doesn't include other things. Like you know, having to take care of kids, having to you know you know have a sec a, a job that often may get in the way of let's say you know having to do GRE preparation and things like that, and so the student parent center is so important, and and, and knowing about it as soon as you get to campus it, it is very very uh, uh, critical. Um, there's the multicultural community center for many students that becomes a second home. There's um, the Office for Undergraduate Research and, and Scholarships. This is a place, um, uh, one of the key criteria for getting into graduate school is whether or not a student has done undergraduate research. Um, especially if you wanna get into some of the higher quality graduate programs across the country, if you haven't done undergraduate research, that becomes a determinant of whether or not you get into those programs. And so knowing um, this office um, is important because that means, especially knowing it early enough, um, because that, that means that you know the opportunities to do this research. With a lot of transfer students, they don't learn about this, this, this office until maybe their second semester. And that means they don't apply until maybe they're, when they're seniors to, for some of the, of the fellowships. Um, and so again, you know, uh, th this is something that, that you want to get to know as soon as possible. Um, there's a student learning center. 
There is the basic needs center. There's a transfer to excellence summer research program in engineering. Um, that's, um, you know, I mean, I think the name says it, you know, for any student who's in engineering, that uh, would be an important program to know. The undergraduate research apprenticeship program, um, that's uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Europe, it, especially for students who are doing research and they want money also along with that, that's a very helpful program. Haas is a high quality, very prestigious program. The program that I run is the Mellon Mason Undergraduate Fellowship Program in the Arts and Humanities. That's the program you want to participate in. The QB3 Undergraduate Biotech Internship, again, very important. Summer Bio Design Immersion Experience. And of course, UC Leeds, uh, which is also known as the Cal Nurse Program at Berkeley. And here you can see just a partial list of those programs for students, for particularly uh, students who might be disproportionately impacted. If they're trying to get to graduate school, they should know at least one, two, or three of these programs that will be key to their uh, pathway in getting to, to graduate school. Now, these are programs that are particularly present uh, at, at Berkeley and at some of the other UCs. But then there are other programs that are present throughout uh, the UC and, and even um, uh, throughout the country. And I wanted to review some of those. Um, uh, the Annual Biomedical Research Conference. The Amgen program, these are for uh, science students. The Ronald McNair post program. Now Berkeley doesn't have this program anymore, but it, it is present throughout the UC and it is a very important program for students uh, to do because again, it provides undergraduate um, research experience. There's the California Forum for Diversity in Graduate Education. Um, a, a great experience to have because it's a place where you can make connections to all of the Ivy League schools if you're trying to graduate, graduate school and often get fee waivers to, uh, for applying to all, 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 almost all of those schools. Um, there's a California pre-doctoral Sally Casanova scholarship. Any student that wants to um, uh, teach at a Cal State uh, University and get part of their education paid for out of UC should think about doing this program. There's the Howard Hughes Medical Institute program the Institute for the Recruitment of Teachers, the Leadership Alliance, the McKnight Doctoral Scholars Program, the UMBC Meyerhoff Scholars Program. And so when you come in, you know, um, when, when um, transfer students come in, uh, they come in as juniors. Um, a lot of students who began as freshmen are already either applying to some of these programs or definitely know about these programs. And so that's the challenge. And so, um, you know, I think part of what, what we may want to think about is how is it that we get our students informed about some of this? And so what I wanted to, to talk a little bit about now and kind of pivot to, to, to discussing is, is the, the graduate admissions process and, and why, um, you know, what it is that we can do um, at the community college level to help our students kind of demystify what the process is about so that we can infuse some of this information in a more effective way and, and be able to assist them. So once they get to the four-year college, they know where to go and they can navigate their way in, in, in a more, in a more uh, precise fashion. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, um, uh, shift to that, but before I shift, I'm gonna stop sharing and see and maybe there's one or two questions I can take. Uh, yeah, Eli, yes. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, great, uh, great list of resources, and you know, like yeah, like you mentioned, right? Getting to know one or one or two or three early on can be so helpful. Um, what, what's your thought? And I know this is, you know, coming from, you know, obviously a, a place of privilege um, and just kind of seeing it uh, in terms of students taking more than two years after they transfer, right? Uh, everyone thinks I'm going to be in, I'm going to be out in two years, I'm saving money. But, you know, like most of those opportunities, right? They, you have to apply, uh, you know, it almost requires you to be there. Uh, yeah, I, I have years. this conversation with transfer students all the time. Yeah, what do you um, think? And, and a lot of them do that. A lot of them do that by necessity, not by choice, um, especially if they're thinking about going to graduate school. 
the unfair thing about that, um, unless you have a full right, if you have a full right, no problem, do it. Because you have a full right. If you have a full right scholarship, there's no reason not to think about doing it because you're getting, that's getting covered. But but not every student has a full right scholarship. If you don't have a full right scholarship, the financial impact is huge, you know? And so in, what I find is that there's some transfer students who actually want to do the opposite. They want to finish sooner rather than later. And so they're thinking about going to school in summers and trying to trying to end like a semester earlier, you know, because their their mindset often is, you know, how can I, you know, you know, gun it, you know, how can I, you know, because they, they, that's that's been their, that's been what they've been used to. They've been used to gunning it uh, in community college. And when you go to the four year institution, you can't do that approach anymore. You know, it, it, you can't, you can't game it that way anymore. Especially if you're trying to get to the, you know, to a prestigious program, you have to be very, very um, smart about, you know, especially if you're going to be uh, taking difficult courses, you know, the, how you plan your courses, you have to be smart so that you can get a good GPA, you can get quality letters of reference, all of that, um, you have to plan it, you know, really, really well. And so my, 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 you know, uh, I, what I do is I work with students to make sure that they're working with a good advisor where they're doing a learning plan as you know uh, as early as possible with advisor in their in their in their department and uh and if they need to take an extra semester that it is absolutely necessary and you know um uh, and, and you know and this is one of the things i was going to talk about later uh but it's you know um you know a lot of students that i work with who began as freshmen one of the key questions that often comes up is do i take a gap year you know, uh, or, you know, do I go immediately and, you know, do I apply in the fall semester of my of my senior year? For transfer students, that's kind of an unfair question because the fall semester of your senior year is like one year after you started, you know? And it's like, you're so new, you're still getting to know campus. It's still new, you know? And, and um, I mean, all those students are precocious and, they're mature, they're amazing. Our students are amazing. And I wouldn't put it past them because they're the students that do the best are always transfer students. I have to tell you that I in my program, they're always transfer students. They're amazing, but we have to be fair to them. We also don't wanna make it a Darwinistic exercise that we're always putting them in that position. And so I think the gap year is compassionate to them. And I think, you know, often they're able to, to, to do it. In my program, you know, we try to uh, encourage them to do it because we provide them with resources to do it. And, and, that, and so they, if they can get into a program similar to mine, you know, where they can get some funding, then that becomes more doable. Uh, Kyle. Thank you, Dr. Ledesma. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question is, you you were sharing a little bit about some of the undergraduate research opportunities and some of the things that we can talk with our students about. One of the questions I had is, how important it is, is it that we have our students in lower division courses doing some of that preparatory research in order to make them competitive for those programs? Yeah, I mean, I think, so one thing that I've gotten, like, for example, I run the Mellon Mason Undergraduate Fellowship Program, and I have had students who um, apply, even as they're applying to the UC, they apply to MMUF, you know? And they're amazing, you know, they're great. You know, they get accepted too. And, and I think, you know, uh, uh, learning about the programs, because they're all posted on the websites, you know, you can learn about all these programs on the websites. And if the students know where they're going, if, you know, the one thing, you know, I think that you can all, you know, think about is, the more students know about their passion, you know, what is it that they want to do with their careers? The sooner that they know about that, the better, you know, um, yeah. um, that, that's, you know, if they know what passion they're going to be pursuing, you know, um, that's the key thing. You know, one of the things that I was going to talk a little bit about is why graduate school? Why, why, you know, why should you even go to graduate school? Why does that matter? You know, and I have this conversation with my students all the time, especially, you know, recently, because, of all the stuff, you know, we had this big strike that happened on campus and that came up, right? You know? um, but why, why does that matter to students? Um, well, you know, especially for dispropor uh, disproportionately impacted students, graduate school 
still matters. Yeah. Um, first of all, it gives you more money, you know, over your, over your life. You know, you have greater earning potential. That's just a fact, you know. Secondly, um, it, it, um, in a lot of fields, and I saw the, the note on business, so I, I don't know that area as much, so, you know, caveat, you know, uh, but, um, secondly, in a lot of fields, certainly in the arts and humanities and the social sciences, uh, there are, uh, openings in terms of new areas where it is the perspective of underrepresented experiences that are particularly needed. Yeah. Those are the things that are needed. And so, you know, it is their experience that needs to be heard. And, and when you become a researcher, a writer, or a scholar, you become a professor, the ripple effect of your ideas over your lifetime is huge. You know, as, a, as an activist, you can certainly change the world, but definitely as a scholar, the way you can impact the world over time, you know, is there, you know. And so when I talk to students, I, I talk to a lot of students who want to be, you know, who want to change the world. That's, 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 that's what they, they talk about. You know, what happens when you're in front of a classroom and you keep talking to year after year of students whose minds you can influence, and particularly in places like Berkeley and other high-level institutions, these students go on and become policymakers, go on and become leaders of society. You know, that matters. That, that's an important place to be. And, and we need those folks to do that. You know, and so, you know, a, a lot, there's a lot of faculty, you know, amazing faculty uh, on this campus who began as transfer students. Yeah. And, and I try to, um, you know, let them know about them. You know, uh, we just had um, um, a faculty member in the School of Education you know, who just joined us, who began as a transfer student. And, and um, you know, um, I send them there that way all the time, you know, because, you know, they're superstars and, and, um, and that's who they can be, but they need to, to be able to envision that. You know? Yeah. Thank you so much. That's, I'm, now I'm really, that's so inspiring. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, sure. So I want to talk a little bit about the graduate admissions process you know, from uh, and then and what I wanted to do is um, I'm going to talk about it as if I was talking to the students because that's usually the presentation that I do. But I want you to to articulate that. I want you to know that that's the presentation I'm doing. You know, I'm doing a presentation. Uh, the 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 you in the presentation is uh, as if I was talking to the students. But I know that I'm talking to you know faculty and and advisors and and and. But that way you know. Um, and so, um, and then after that, I'll end and we can take questions. And, and uh, I, I, I think I'm a little bit behind, so I apologize for that. Um, we'll end wherever we need to end, you know, just to take um, the last questions. Um, it, it, would that be okay, Kyle? Um, is, is... Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're doing great. Okay, Fantastic. okay. all right, yeah, yeah, great. Think all right, here I go. All right. Uh, So let's talk about the graduate school application process and why it is that information becomes so important. So when we talk about the mystifying the graduate application process, um, I, we've already spoke a little bit about why going to graduate school. One key question that comes up is, you know, do you get a master's or a doctorate? It really depends on, on the field and it depends on the aspiration for the students. A lot of it also depends on, on money, you know, uh, whether or not um, um, students have the resources and the preparation. Um, I talk to a lot of students, you know, because I'm in the arts and humanities who want to be, you know, novelists and writers. And so getting an MFA, for example, is, is you know, that that is a terminal degree in that career. So, um, you know, that's different than, than, let's say, if you are thinking about literature where getting the PhD might be the way. And so you really have to get educated in terms of your field and what you want to get, you know, uh, uh, get ready for. Then again, if you want to go into literature, but you don't have enough courses in that area, you want to get a little bit more preparation than getting a master's along the way or getting a master's before that becomes important. However, getting a master's is not usually funded. And so that may bring with it a financial hit. And so, um, you know, that, that also, uh, I, I talked to a lot of students who don't want to do that. And so then applying to a doctorate uh, uh, becomes a question. Um, when and where to apply. So these are the things I'm going to review. 
Um, I'm going to talk about, you know, the view from the other side to give you a little peek from behind the curtain. You know, what happens, you know, I, I've sat on a lot of admissions committees and I can tell you a little bit about what happens on the other side. And then, um, you know, uh, when students prepare their application, when they prepare your application, right, you know, what goes into it and, and how, you should, how you should approach it, funding your application and deciding on a graduate program is when you get a, a, an offer, how you should decide it and then why the statement of purpose is so important. So when you apply again, fall of your senior year or gap year, and we spoke about this, again, for uh, transfer students, this might be an, a little bit of an unfair question. And often my experience is that most transfer students, not all, because we do have those superstars, but most, the vast majority, end up taking at least one gap year. And, and what you do in that gap year becomes important because in order to remain as competitive as possible, there has to be some kind of academic uh, relative activity that you're doing in that gap year to make sure that you remain um, you know, as competitive as possible for the program that you're applying to. And, and I, you know, I, I have a lot of conversations with students about that. You know, um, if you are in literature, for example, are you working, let's say, um, you know, uh, in an in a editorial office, for example, that, that keeps you, you know, they, they can see a connection there, or if you're working in a library, things like that. Um, where to apply? Um, now, before COVID, uh, my recommendation to students was, you know, for them to have a good chance to get into a program was, you know, you should apply to five to 10 schools, you know, and actually, if you if you had gone to the Institute for the Recruitment of Teachers in Boston, um, they recommended like you know ten to twelve, a lot. This is before COVID. But one of the things that happens with COVID, that happened with COVID, was that a lot of programs, not just in the arts and humanities and social sciences, but throughout disciplines, they actually shrunk their programs. And so instead of accepting, let's say, you know, eight students per year, they would accept four. And so by what happened because of that is that programs across the country got more competitive. And so today, my suggestion would be to, you know, really apply to, you know, eight to 12, really, in order to get accepted, to, to, be, to be able to get into your, you know, a school that you're going to be happy with, to have a priority list, to have rich schools and have schools that you would be happy with, you really need to have that kind of a list. But what that means is you need to have the budget to be able to apply to that many schools, unless you get, of course, uh, fee waivers. A lot of our students, because of their financial profile, do qualify for fee waivers. EOP has fee waivers. MMUF has fee waivers. A lot of the programs I listed if you join them, we'll provide you with fee waivers. But that's why you want to qualify for those programs. Ranking, you know, so what, how are you going to determine which schools you go to? One way will be, you know, by ranking, right? You know, choose the best schools. The National Research Council will give you that. U.S. News and World Report will give you another thing. Um, maybe the size of the department. What kind of department do you want to be in? Um, it might be a huge department. It might be a small department. It really, you know, you, you, you need to decide, you know. Um, culture of the department, how do you decide, you know, or how do you determine the culture of the department? Sometimes um, you can go to a, uh, um, a department and you look, you can look up um, their um, uh, web pages and find the, the, the faculty and the graduate students. And you can actually email graduate students and, and you know, email them questions about uh, about their their departments and just ask, hey, how do you like it there? And and find out, you know, gossip about it. Um, this is very typical, you know, for that to happen. Sometimes you get good things, you know, sometimes you don't. Um, and, and a lot of the recruitment, you know, happens that way. Um, the alignment of PhDs with your career and personal goals, you know, uh, where are those PhDs going? You know, are they going to the kinds of places where you want to be? You know, um, you can if you don't find those things in the website, you can always ask the department to give you that information. And, and that's that's something that that can really help determine where, where you apply. Um, if you find that a lot of the people that they're producing are going to industry, is that what you want to do? You know, um, there were some departments where I found that a lot of the people that are graduating were going to Google 
you know, is that where you want to go? <laughs> so that 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 becomes a question. Um, you can also um, do research in terms of having, you know, the kind of advisors you want to have. My recommendation for, for students is don't just search for that one superstar amazing advisor that you want to have, you know. Um, don't just search, you know, for, you know, um, you know the, that name of that book that you always, you know, that person that you always wanted to work with. Because on the year that you apply, maybe that person's not even, you know, they're on sabbatical, you know. Um, maybe that person's not taking students anymore. So what you want to do is you want to find three people that you want to work with. That way you have an, an intellectual community that you're going to be working with. And, and that, that, that becomes important. Look for that kind of nurturing community. And you can find all this in the web pages. That means doing homework. And again, when you're looking at eight to 12 places, you're doing a lot of homework. That means that, you know, that's why, you know, taking that gap here, that's why it matters. Because you're spending, it's almost like having a second job. You're spending, you know, months doing this kind of this kind of work. And I, I often work with students where, you know, I ask them to go on Google Docs, develop a folder, develop, you know, you know, you know, eight to twelve subfolders and name them after the schools that you're applying for, and then begin doing the homework and putting it there. Because you need to be organized in order to do this. So what happens in the admissions committee when you apply? Um, this is behind the veil, behind the, the curtain. Um, when you get admitted to the undergraduate, uh, uh, um, for your undergraduate career, you don't get admitted by your department. You get admitted by the university. And usually a staff will admit you. But when you get admitted to graduate school, it is not the university that admits you. It is the department that admits you. And so that means that the faculty who are going to work with you, they get into this small room with this large table. There's a faculty chair and then a bunch of other faculty. And they sit around the table. There's all this big stack of applications, depending on the department. There's you know, some departments that are small, so it's not as big a stack. You know? um, and then there's sometimes a GSAO, that's a graduate student affairs officer. And sometimes there's a diversity director. That, that, that's me. You know? Sometimes, not in every time, because you know, I work with 19 departments, but in a given year, I might be invited to like five, um, uh, five discussions, you know. Um, and so the applications arrive um, and there's, you know, you know, let's say for some of the larger departments, you know, like English, you know, um, and they usually admit like, you know, 12 students, you know, 10 to 12 students, something like that. And for those 10 to 12, they might get, you know, 600 applications. So when the applications first arrive, not everybody's gonna read those applications. That's too many applications. So they get divided up among those, uh, uh, that, th those faculty where um, the faculty chair and the other faculty will read chunks of these applications, you know, from A to, B, uh, these two faculty, they usually are read in teams. These two faculty will read these applications. And then, um, you know, as long as the two faculty agree on the decision, they are then, um, you know, that's the decision for that. And their task is to produce a, a, a preliminary list, a semifinal list. Um, and then it, move, it moves forward. Um, now, if there's a, a, um, a, a, a if there's a, a disagreement, usually the faculty chair doesn't read. There, the faculty chair reads the disagreements. The, uh, the faculty chair is the tiebreaker. Uh, my job is usually to help with, um, you know, you know, if there are questions around uh, representation and uh, making the process more inclusive. That's that's my job. Um, What's included in the in the application? Um, so um, we're going to review that after this slide. What do the um, uh, members of the committee look for in an application? Genuine interest in the in advanced study and research. Sufficient and relevant academic preparation. 
determination to succeed, promise of research and teaching, good fit between applicants' interests and faculty research priorities, availability of appropriate mentors, advice. So this is what I was talking about, you know, that, that they want, you know, make sure that a person's not on sabbatical, right? A balance of interest among the cohort. So, you know, if it's a large department, you know, um, they don't want everybody being admitted in, in the large department in one area. They want to spread it out. And then, you know, diversity sometimes, you know, matters, you know, if they want, if they want, um, you know, within the confines of the law, because 209 does, does weigh in, you know, um, um, uh, at, that, at that point. The elements of that application, uh, you know, they look at transcripts, research experience, again, uh, um, and so this for transfer students, that's why it matters that as soon as they get to campus, that they think about how is it that they're going to get the research experience? Where is it that they're going to get the research experience? You don't want transfer students, if they want to get to graduate school, graduating you know, from their BA without having had either a thesis class, you know, where they've written a thesis, or a class where they've written a long research paper. They need to have done that. Um, there's a statement of purpose and a personal history statement, letters of recommendation, a writing sample, particularly in the humanities and social sciences. And depending on the year, in the last few years, the GRE has not been required. But I can tell you that this year, there's rumblings that it may be required again in some places. And so if it is required again, that means that students also need to do prep courses for this. And in some programs, there are interviews, mostly Zoom interviews, but there are some, there are, there are interviews. Now, um, I, I'm going to rush through this last few things and then, and then just, you know, um, and, um, and, uh, and take your questions. So when we talk about transcripts, and you want to think about what this means for your students, for transfer students, and, and some of the unfairness here, you know, because um, when admissions committees look at transcripts, you know, even though technically the minimum is, is 3.0, that's, that's what's required, at least for high quality programs, you're really looking at 3.5 or higher, you know, as, as, the, as, the, uh, as the GPA. For transfer students, that means that as soon as you get to, 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 to the university, you're being asked to perform at a high level as soon as you get to university. You know, again, to be an, you know, um, focus is on key upper division courses, but again, transfer students, as soon as you get to university, you're taking upper division courses as soon as you get there. Junior and senior year are more important, but transfer students by definition are junior and senior courses. Letters of recommendation, and this is something that is important for you because a lot of community college instructors and advisors write letters of recommendation for um, community college students. But here's where you can advise your students in terms of how they can get letters. And often also because a lot of transfer students are afraid of their faculty in um, the four-year college. They're, they're, they're intimidated and they will go to you and they will rely on you and they will say, you know, you are great. You're fantastic in community college. But those faculty out there in, in, you know, at Berkeley or Davis or whatever, they're like intimidating. I don't want to go talk to them. They're like, they're not like you. But they need them to get to graduate school. These letters are extremely important. I know that the faculty at four-year colleges and places like Berkeley are prima donnas, but those are the letters they need. Three are needed. These letters from faculty are the most desirable. When faculty and other universities are reading letters, they're looking for those names. Show the faculty your list of schools and ask for advice. So when students decide which schools they're going to, the faculty in their departments probably know the people on the admissions committees that are gonna be making decisions on them. They can actually help them. But if our students are afraid of talking to the faculty, they're not going to get that advice. So we can help them by helping them with that fear. Remind them about your achievements. We can coach them. 
by coaching them about how to talk about their achievements, by coaching them about how to talk about their project or, or their vision for their project. Provide the recommenders with transfers, resume statements, due dates, et cetera. We can help them by you know, uh, showing them how to organize their information. Start early, remind them. The earliest they can start is already in community college. Right. So funding. Now, one thing that you should know is that if our students are going to PhD programs, for almost all of the students today, they should all be funded, all of them. Sometimes even some master's and MS programs will be funded. Most of those though are, are still, you're gonna have to pay something. Funding is available from many sources. There are mixed pa packages that uh, they, they tend to be very conventional. Um, when our students apply for graduate programs, that application for admission is also a financial aid application. Make sure that they know that and they, they, they check the appropriate boxes to be considered for financial aid. Um, Universities usually support um, stipend, tuition, and fees. Uh, when they get support, is usually in the form of fellowship, training grants, uh, GSI ships, and GSR ships. They can also apply for extramural fellowships, which will pay stipends, tuition, plus fees. And these are uh, things like you know, um, um, it used to be the Ford uh, Fellowship or, you know, now there's a Mellon uh, Fellowship. There's different kinds. There's National Science Foundation. This is why you go to the Office of Undergraduate Fellowships, uh, you know, to find out about some of these things. Uh, for external fellowships, you you always want to know the deadlines. And that's why, you know, getting yourself organized becomes so important because then you can put all those deadlines um, in, in, in your um, informational packets. Now, let's say you get in, great, hooray, you know, we celebrate, right? Um, how do you decide where to go? I work with a lot of students where they were given a lot of money from some campuses we should not name about whose colors are red. Um, and, um, and they ended up not going there. Um, and um, the reason, and you know, they, they, they've also been affected to, you know, Berkeley and other places. But, you know, after they've done their homework, after they've been accepted, you know, um, they find out more about those, those places. You know, you definitely want to read the fine print. And one key thing that I always tell students is don't just look at the number that they're giving you on the offer letter. Check the website for the total cost of attendance. That way you can compare the number you've been giving to the total cost of attendance in terms of what, 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 you know, how much you're going to be on the hook for when you get there. Ask many questions as much as you can, because you want to know, you know, are you going to be able to thrive there once you get there? Are, are people happy there? You know, if you can visit, um, if they have a diversity officer, check in with that person. And if they don't have one, why don't they? You know, it's like, wow. And especially today, right? You know, and so that that's, um, you want to consider academic quality, structure of the program, career outcomes as much as possible. Just take it all, take it all in. Most programs, when they offer you admission, they're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in you to bring you in. And so you should invest time and money in making that decision yourself. And, and I find the students who take the time end up being happier, you know, uh, once they get there. And often, you know, I work with a lot of students who don't take the biggest offer. They, they take the one that seems to be the most thoughtful. And, and that, that does matter. Now, why statement of purpose matter? Remember when I showed you that table? That table, had that stack of applications. Would guess how long faculty take to read that packet of materials? And remember everything that went into that packet, right? You know, we had all those things: statement of purpose, writing sample, transcripts, all of that stuff. Guess how long it takes them to read that? Average. You know, it usually takes them 
15 to 20 minutes. I don't know about you, but I can't read like a packet that is like, you know, anywhere from like 50 to 70 pages. I can't read that fast. So what that means is that they're really skimming fast. And the one thing that they skim the quickest is the statement of purpose. And so that statement needs to be as compelling as possible. It needs to tell the story in an engaging fashion. And, and really they look at that along with the transcript, along with maybe one or two letters of reference. And if it sells them, they'll advance it. And if it doesn't sell them, they'll make a decision really quick. And so that's why we wanna be able to encourage our students to approach the statement of purpose for graduate school, not the way they approach the statement that they wrote when they got into undergrad, not to approach it like a like a, a job, um, you know, when they write a, a letter, a, a, a job application. It's not the same thing. It's one of the most important things they're ever going to write in their life, and it, and it's its own genre of literature, actually. And so that's why I wanted to share with you, you know. It follows this, uh, a very common rhetorical flow. And so even though I'm kind of sharing this with you, it, 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 it's not a formula. It's not a formula. It is, it is a very uh, important piece of writing, but it, it has to have all these things in it. In compelling writing. The first paragraph usually opens with a compelling hook and it shares a uh, personal history and connects it to the discipline that you want to pursue. The second paragraph focuses on your early academic motivation. Third paragraph usually focuses on the quality of your academic background. Fourth paragraph focuses on the nature of the research project you want to focus on in graduate school. Fifth paragraph focuses on your academic fit um, into that university or department. And before ending, the sixth paragraph uh, focuses on faculty that you may want to work with. So it felt not, not they don't always have to go in this order. Typically they do. They don't always have to go in this order. And it's written very elegantly most of the time, you know, very artfully, you know. Uh, but almost always, this is the rhetorical flow. And um, so the faculty know this. And so they know what to look for, you know. So I just want to share a few factoids about Berkeley and then we'll end here. Um, so here um, at Berkeley, um, ooh, um, doctoral students, you can see that this is for, for last year, um, for 2022, there were 802 doctoral students and 3,239 master students continuing, you know, so you can see overall that, you know, we, we've had like a, a total of 12,828 uh, students. Oops, sorry about that. Hope so. Um, in terms of statistics for women, 48% of our students are women and 15% are um, underrepresented minorities. Average age is 28, youngest is 18, oldest is 74. Here you can see, you know, we're a high performing um, uh, university. You can see the programs that are rated in the top 10, some in the top, you know, top, top, you know. And so what that means is that those admissions committees really tend to be very rigid in their um, approach. Um, we produce a lot of degrees. Um, here's how much it costs. You know, so even though tuition and fees is about $15,000 for academic programs, um, and, and when you add insurance, it's about $20,000, $21,000. When you add housing, food, books, personal and transportation, it really, it brings it up to, uh, excuse me, uh, 50 some odd thousand. Now our um, um, fellowships, you know, that we provide is they're about $36,000, but that doesn't include summer. So, so our fellowship does cover the total cost, but barely. And so, you know, attending a foreign institution is expensive. And this is why, you know, so one thing that I wanted to say about the effective experience, you know, our students are brilliant, but because of all this stuff, they tend to experience imposter syndrome. And so it is prevalent at Research 20 universities. 
and, and students, they tend to come in with more um, focus and resiliency. And often they don't know this. And so we need to remind them. And they tend to know what they want. And, and they do appreciate the opportunity to study uh, what they enjoy. And so we need to remind them of this as much as possible. And so that, that's, um, that's where I wanted to end. So with that, I um, wanted to leave for your questions. And um, if ever you will need to contact me, I'm happy to take your questions. So right now I'm gonna stop sharing and I think we have like 14 minutes for questions. Okay. okay, we can use the raise hand feature or you can put things in the chat. We're all familiar with Zoom. Thank you, Alberto. Sure, sure. I mean, I just have a comment. It's a lot of information that you provided. Um, I mean, I remember when I was applying they, I mean, I took like courses and stuff like that to improve my writing and everything for essay writing and, it, you know, to make sure that it pops. But just like the information that you provided really shows that you have to do all these things to stand out. Otherwise, you just get passed by. And it's like a demo reel for, you know, my profession, which is animation. And if you don't interest them in the first three to 10 seconds, they just move on. Yeah. So it's it's a lot of pressure on my, I remember having the pressure on myself and now seeing it from the outside, I'm like, ah, poor kids, <laughs> you know, <laughs> poor, poor kids. But it's also the only way you're gonna stand out. So um, uh, I guess, do we provide these type of services like, um, and things like that? Okay. Yeah, and, and the thing, Monica, is that the services are there and our students are brilliant. They're amazing. And they're and they're very resourceful, and they tend to find, um, you know, they could do it on their own. I mean, because they're talented, but they could do it so much easier too. They don't have, you know, it doesn't have to be a Darwinistic experience. You know, they could do it so much easier. Um, and I, I think that the whole goal is that, you know, let's be more compassionate in the process. And if we can make it easier, why don't we do that? Uh, Jennifer. Okay, I had a question about um, what resources you would recommend for students thinking about the the gap year, mm -hmm. and that's always you know something big that that we we tackle. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed is for a lot of our first gen Latinx students who transfer, more and more students because of the expense are. Um, living at home, staying living at home and have the pressure from family and um, are commuting, you know, when they go to a school like Berkeley and then they take the gap year and then they have a lot of pressure from family, you know, to get a job and start making money. And so a lot of times students who say that they were going to take that one gap year um, struggle to find their way back to graduate school. Um, and so uh, like, it's just, you know, that's just a, a difficult thing to, to navigate. And I don't know if there's like a specific place or resource that you would say, like, this would be like the number one place or, you know, one or two places that before they graduate that they could take advantage of there on campus to have them do something during that gap year that will keep them focused and get them that experience. Yeah. So, um, so at Berkeley, there are a number of places. Um, the grad division at Berkeley has, um, a course that they teach called gigs getting into graduate school and and that that's a great course um that uh, ends up uh, with a um with a plan for students including a statement of purpose that that they that they produce but that plan that that they develop uh takes into consideration what it is that they're going to do during the gap year and i think you know students uh, uh when they leave when they graduate having uh, a plan in, including an idea of when it is that they're going to be if they're going to be doing for example a test preparation course before they go to their families you know knowing that they're going to like in october they're going to join you know kaplan or princeton whatever that that, that they're going to be doing that and they are able to tell their families that i'm um, during this time i'm going to be doing this or i'm i'm going to have to you know you know do my job in order to 
uh, uh, to do this, that they're able to describe to their families because often um, what they're doing is that they're socializing their families also in that yes. process. And so um, with their experience, it, they're guiding the family along, but, but they need to do that beforehand because it is true. If they don't do that, then they get, they get stuck back in into what they used to be before they left. And that happens a lot. I've seen a lot of the students where their plan, you know, and brilliant students, their plan before they left, they, they haven't executed it. Um, but students who have clear, clear plans, they do stick to them. And next thing you know, I see them in graduate school. Yeah. So that's fantastic. So that's a course that they could take the gigs? That, that is a course. Um, it's called gigs, getting into graduate school. They can, they can work with that. But the different divisions uh, also have similar kinds of courses. Uh, their uh, graduate school preparation courses. All right, thank you so much. Sure, yeah. Monica, I see your hand again. Yes, hi. Um, I have a question about, I understand that you guys are focusing more on like business and things like that, but do you have anything dedicated to like the arts program? Because there's students that we have that are interested in moving on into like a master's program for the arts that they require to submit portfolios. And of course they have like a range of portfolio pieces and which ones do they choose? And I mean, I try to guide them, but I'm not exactly in the admissions process of universities, especially for art programs. And I'm wondering if there's resources provided by you guys or where I can find these resources? Yeah, I actually have a colleague in my office that works exactly with that. And so you can give him my name, I can get him connected to that. Because that, that's, that's, that's my area, that's in the arts and humanities. And we have, um, we have the uh, art practice uh, program and uh, we have an undergraduate specialist who works with uh, prospective students there. Uh, Eli. Hello. Um, so uh, when I was at Berkeley, uh, my before being a, a professor here, I, I worked with the McNair Scholars Program for, for many years um, and other programs where we worked directly with transfer students with the goal of getting them to graduate school. Um, so, I, you know, like I, I, I almost feel, you know, have looking at this, it's like, wow, it is almost overwhelming, right? Because even if you look at the research.berkeley.edu site, I think there's like 80 different opportunities right. for students to do that's just one site right um what like as faculty what can we tell students if we, you know say hey we're not you know we won't see you anymore or, you know maybe um what can we tell them okay do these two or three things you know this summer or you know your first semester as a as a transfer student um you know to the university what, what would you recommend um just like a few tidbits for them to take yeah i mean i think um a couple of things or places where I would begin. One would be the Office for Undergraduate Research, you know, beginning there, um, amazing, you know. Um, I think another office that I would begin uh, would be um, in the Transfer Student Center. Um, uh, I, I, you know, you probably, I don't know if you, if you work um, um, uh, with um, um, Aldez. Um, Lorena. Lorena, yeah, yeah, Lorena's amazing, ah, yeah. Lorena is amazing and she has uh, a number of courses um, that I think she can connect uh, folks with, you know, Luisa is an amazing, you know, um, um, uh, ambassador also that I think, you know, would be, I mean, those would be places that I would uh, suggest folks, you know, kind of um, um, connect with, um, you know, that, that would be in terms of like the pathway to academic um, kind of progression, those would be uh, immediate uh, places. They're gonna get, um, you know, as soon as they come into campus, they're gonna get standard as part of their orientation to campus, you know, to the SLC, um, to EOP, to basic needs, all those are gonna get, uh, they're gonna learn about those really, really quickly as part of their bare orientation experience. They're gonna get that. But um, those other offices, they, they do need to connect to that. And then uh, with their major advisor, I would make sure that they're able to connect with their major advisor as soon as possible. Um, that's, that's really, really important. Um, often, uh, one of the things that we've been trying to work with is uh, in the various uh, majors 
um, there's major transitions or um, transfer um, tr uh, transition courses that um, make it easy for uh, students um, uh, to be able to connect their transfer experience to the major. And that that uh, might be a good a good place, you know, for them. It would be um, a, a course that would be a lower units, um, and, um, um, and and it will allow them, you know, to to learn more about, um, you know, Berkeley's um, approach to certain disciplines, and and be able to make a connection, you know, to faculty in the department. Um, there there are also those courses. The other nice thing about those courses is that they're usually um, taught by faculty who are um, widely considered to be um, more expert teachers, more accessible teachers. And so they're not as intimidating. They're, they're more um, um, pedagogically gifted. So for that GITS course, can anybody take that or you have to be at UC Berkeley to take that? For the GITS course, I believe you have to be at UC Berkeley for the GITS course, that you have to be um, uh, an undergraduate student. Thanks. Yeah. I think one of the things um, listening to this conversation as we're talking, I think is, and this is something I, I know I've, had this conversation we've had some common students jennifer we've talked a lot about this we i can think of a few common students one common student in particular early in my time at ohlone um uh our students sometimes see this wall with institutions like berkeley stanford etc where it is not accessible to them in the sense of psychologically or emotionally they see this place as a place that is not for them and i think a lot of what you talked about today um, equips us with tools to help us to talk to them and give them language about the transfer process from us to there, but also to think about these places as destinations for them for graduate school, which is I really appreciate so much. I think it's a it's a big part of the work that we do, instructional faculty do, and our counselors do, is to help to break down that kind of psychological wall a bit that that our students have and then even some of us have right about that we carry that sort of baggage about some of these institutions um and that's what opens these institutions up and i just so i just want to share my appreciation um for that because that's what makes places like berkeley stanford etc better places um than they've been in the past um and um i also want to say and this is to all of us as as colleagues and um, to instructional faculty and to counselors and librarians for us to think about what we can take from this to start working collaboratively about what we do here to create um, workshops and structures to launch our students out. Um, I think we do such amazing work um, when we bring our students in and we've really done a great job of building a receptive space and we have more work to do but how we we help bridge our students out into institutions is something a place where we can continue to grow and i i'm so inspired by what you had to say so this isn't even a question alberto it's just a comment it's just a compliment um to say that i'm really inspired um to kind of work with all of us in this room um, to get together um, and to to grow and to think about how we can um, to to make these these institutions even better for our students. Well, I'm you know I'm also inspired by what you all do um, because I think often um, I mean one of the principles that I sometimes use at Berkeley is this idea of what's called pedagogical discomfort. Yeah. You know, um, which is like you know in order for for our students to build a sense of independence and, you know, uh, individual kind of individual in, individual initiative is that, you know, we, 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 we want to make it so that they can do things on their own. But support is so important and support is, is, is you know, um, being there for them, um, especially, um, you know, at a time when there's, there's just so much going on. 
is 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 very significant. It's very you know, and, and I think that that at community college, that's been a consistent thing that they've known, that yeah. you all have been rocks for them, and I don't think that they know that as as much at at a, at a UC, and so you model that for us, and and we try to we try to do that as much as we can too. Um, and, and so I want to thank you for that because, you know, you set that bar for us. And, and so I appreciate that for you. You know, thank you so much for doing that. So we're, we're coming to a close with our time. It's 2.30 and I know folks do have other um, workshops to start getting close to heading to. So I want to open the floor if there are any remaining questions, um, comments. Otherwise, I want to thank our workshop leader and speaker, Alberto Ledesma, Dr. Alberto Ledesma, for a really exceptional workshop. Um, and uh, I've known you for a very long time. <laughs> I was going to say, one of the communities of care that helped me so much was a place that where I got to know you, the Student Learning Center at Berkeley. And so it's really amazing um, to have you in this space um, and to have you join us here um, uh, as, uh, as part of this workshop for the Lytton Center here at Ohlone College. And um, we will be taking all of this inspiration and all of this great work with us um, this fall and hopefully beyond and working with our students. Thank you to all of you who attended today. Make sure um, you um, get credit. I also want to um, put a little plug for Alberto's book. I put a link um, <laughs> uh, to his book. G you know, get it. Go get that book. I know um, many of you already have it um, and have read it. Um, it's really um, incredible work. Um, uh, and um, we'll be hearing more from Alberto um, this fall and see more from him. And please, thank you. Let's give a big round of applause. Thank you for Alberto uh, joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.